Fall 1979, Archbold Stadium is quickly becoming a memory. The Carrier Dome construction is well underway, while the football team plays all their games on the road. And there is great anticipation for the final basketball season in the Manly Fieldhouse. And, you know, now you're entering a conference, which involves New York City media and Boston media, and it's just uh, a lot of the local fans are on fire. You know, this is a big thing. It is also Coach Jim Beheim's fourth season at the helm of the basketball team. Since taking over for Roy Danforth in 1976, the wins are already piling up in his illustrious Hall of Fame career. It was also the senior seasons for Roosevelt Bowie and Louis Orr. You know, the Louie and Bowie show. But before we go much further, there's something you need to know. Louis didn't like to be called Louie, not at all. And it was a bad thing if, you know, it was, it, you've already crossed over. In the Daily Orange, they had a, um, they did a caricature. And in the caricature, they had the basketball, they had top hats and canes. Louis said, my name's not Louie. I was like, hey, I didn't make it up. <laughs> I was like, so. It was Lewis. So they just, they just went with us. They didn't ask us anything. They went with it, and then I, it was kind of fun. As a rising star at Kendall High School, Roosevelt Bowie understood. It just wasn't enough being the right altitude. You had to have the right attitude. I'm going to run till the guy I'm playing against dies, and then I'm going to score. Whether it's the first half or the second half, that was my concept of basketball. Nobody was going to out, outrun me, outwork me on the court. Recruiting the 6'11 buoy was a major priority for Syracuse University and many others. In the mid-1970s, the small village of Kendall, New York, was a popular destination for college coaches. Michigan State, Duke, uh, Georgia Tech, Oklahoma State. It was hard to ignore that during his three years in high school, Roosevelt's Kendall Eagles were 65 and one, and it captured four consecutive Section C championships. I'd actually met Coach Behind when, he, when I was 16 years old, he was 30. So I met him because I went to basketball camp. Actually, if you go back, Roosevelt Bowie, Hal Cohen, Dal Shackelford, and I, Martin Head went to SU basketball camp. That was kind of how you found kids in those days. Talking to Coach Beheim, it was like, holy smokes, this guy really knows basketball. And he was real laid back. I mean, the thing that was important for me is I tried to find uh, a male figure with the temperament like my father. Okay, because my father was a man of a few words, soft spoken. When he spoke, he listened. Not a person that yelled, but he said what he meant and meant what he said. And I went to Syracuse and I loved it. Basketball is a game of percentages, averages, feet, and inches. Yeah, statistics measure everything. Everything but desire, the kind that motivated Marty Head. One of the biggest questions about me was, am I a Division I kid? Yeah. You know, there was a lot of people who didn't think I was you know, because of my foot speed and uh, I'm very small. And Marty was a big time player for Christian Brothers Academy in Syracuse. His teams won championships every year he was on the varsity. And he saved the best for last in the 1977 battle for the Section 3 Class A crown. Directing coach Bob Velasco's offense, Marty led a wild overtime comeback thriller against Utica Notre Dame by scoring 32 points. His efforts that year earned him a first team All-State selection. But it was a slow, methodical, half-court offense, which I could run. Now that helped me develop um, to be a much better guard. And as I got older at CBA, I started to ship myself out. I'd go to Manly, try to get in pickup games with the SU guys. And I went up to SU basketball camp two summers in a row. So between my improvement over a couple summers and then the success that we had at CBA and the power of Bob Falasco's uh, uh, no-nonsense coaching, uh, 
Coach Beheim threw in his hat with me and said, you know, I'd love for you to come up here, and I was proud of it. Also in Marty's class of 1981 was fellow Syracusan Danny Shays out of Janesville DeWitt High School. Roosevelt and Danny kept getting in fights in practice. So Danny came in and Danny's big as a house and I gotta let everybody know every day from, from the very first day whose team it is and I didn't want him to get a, a rebound, a jump ball, the score and I was physical and aggressive and I don't think he finished a practice for the first six weeks. But our furthest recruit away was Lewis in Cincinnati. We were very much a, a northeastern recruiting mm -hmm. platform. Cohen from Canton, Bowie and Burns, the Rochester area, Jarepko, Buffalo, Shackelford, Utica, and Hedden Shays from Syracuse. And the thing that I really liked about it was all of us came from schools that were had winning programs. Me and Danny, we were very proud to represent the area. Well, I'm a freshman coming into uh, SU. The fun is over because you're being recruited, you're playing in all-star games, everybody's telling you how great you are, and it's like, that's over with. When you get to the college level, these guys can see everything that's going on, and there's no excuses. And really, the reason they're correcting you is to make you better. You, know, you had a core group of incredibly strong inside play with Marty Burns, Shackelford, and now you sprinkle in Bowie and Orr. It's like, holy cow, what guard wouldn't want to play with those guys? And that one of the first things that Dale Shackford said to me was, no one is greater than the team. And I was like, I'm down with that. We never had a crossword, ever. At age 16, I lost my younger brother. He was 11 to leukemia. So I always felt like I came to Syracuse and I found Dale Shackelford, who was an upperclassman. I found an older brother, and then I found a kindred spirit in, in Lewis Orr. And it was just like, it was like I had that whole family feeling. So my grandmother used to say all the time, birds of a feather flock together. We didn't drink or do anything. So that was, we had the little saints corner over there. That, that was us. We didn't, I, they used to call me the Kool-Aid kid. One time in practice, while scrambling for a rebound, Marty pushed Lewis under the boards. Well, he whirled around and elbowed me in the side of the head and, you know, staggered me a little bit. And, uh, you know, later in the locker room, he was, oh, I'm so sorry, Marty. Um, you know, all over and over. And it's like, oh, no, no, no. We found similarities. And uh, one of them was, uh, you know, his, his religious upbringing. He was very easy to talk to. But Lewis was a little bit of like a minister. It was an influence to everybody. If you went around the room with Lou, 100% of the people liked him. He was just a great guy. The final year at Manly, and the backcourt was rocking. At the point, Eddie Moss, Marty Head, long range shooter, and do it all and do it well Hal Cohen, who in his junior year at Canton Central High led New York State schoolboys with a 34.5 per game average. Is it any wonder why they called him the fastest gun in the North Country? And Roosevelt Bowie was wondering who the dude was with the big stats. I'm like, he's got to be some big macho guy. So I get to Syracuse, and Hal's like a little blonde haired, curly haired, blue eyed, curly haired, and he's like 6'2. And I was like, Son of a gun. One day shortly after Marty signed with SU, assistant coach Rick Patino pulled him aside with a message. I never would have recruited you. He goes, I, I don't think much of you at all. But he goes, Coach Beheim loves you. He goes, now I gotta get out of New York and I gotta find somebody to play with you. And that someone was Fast Eddie Moss, a fearless point guard with a quick step, a smooth handle, 
and an edgy attitude. What a lot of people didn't know, when Ed Moss came to Syracuse University, he walked in the door and he said, listen, hey, I'm down to play with you guys, but all that freshman crap about, you know, got to be, carry the bags, got to do all that stuff, he said, that's out. I don't do that. It was like, we, we all on the team, the same team, we're all on the same level, we're teammates. Let's play like that. While the two teens complimented each other in the backcourt, there was a glaring contrast in their upbringing. Marty, from the white middle-class neighborhood of the Syracuse West Side, and the African-American Eddie from the urban Woodside projects of Queens. At first, he didn't like me, you know, and I don't know, I didn't like him either, I guess. Um, he had never been with a white person before, and we were literally thrown together. And not only on the court and stuff, but academically. And it's, it's a thing where we don't care what you think. You, you know, you two are f together forever. But after about five, six weeks of it, and by the end of freshman year, it was an unbelievable friendship. We were thrown together, and uh, we both struggled in the beginning academically. But after the first semester, it was clear that we were on double secret probation. So we had to form a tutor, which they got us, and his name was Freddie McDonald. There was times when he would talk to Eddie, and then he'd talk to me, but he'd talk a totally, not only different way, but about different stuff. But a lot of it was about life, and Freddie really brought us together, where me and Eddie, after that year, could really see each other and figure out what we were about. It was a great beginning. For the ending, the season was rolling along. 12-0 and, and rolling along number five in the country, and headed to number 10 Purdue. Talking national TV, talking Battle of the Big Men, Bowie versus Joe Barry Carroll. And every, everyone kept interviewing me. They want to say, well, how's, how's Roosevelt Bowie going to do against Joe Barry Carroll? And I said, Roosevelt Bowie doesn't have to play Joe Barry Carroll. Joe Barry Carroll has to play against Syracuse University, and I like my chances with Syracuse University. However, it was Eddie Moss who stole the show. With his deflections and his steals, he really flipped that game. Early in the game, Bowie overheard Purdue point guard Brian Walker dissing Moss's game. I went, oh. and Ed Moss got down so low on defense. The first time he just picked his pocket clean. He stole the ball from him, I think, three times in a row. And the fourth time he tipped it, I stole it. I, I threw it to him, I ran down the floor, he gave it back to me, and I dunked it, and I got fouled with the foul line. Listen, Ed Moss was, he, from the day he stepped on campus, he was, in, he was in charge of the team. He knew how to run it, he knew what pace he wanted him to go. Eddie's dead now, he's been dead a while. He'd always say, boy, I'd love to do that once. And that's my one thing where, just my best friend in the world, uh, Eddie, Edwin Derek Moss, yeah. I can see why the story came out about Coach Beheim didn't want to leave Man. Why would I want to leave this place? That may have quite possibly been the, one of the, the most intense places that I've ever been in. Because, you know, they started that stomp your feet, clap your hands thing, so that was really loud. And it was now structurally very sound, you know, seating about 9,000, it was great. Imagine a dome-shaped building, jump ball in the center with everybody in there stomping their feet and clapping their hands. It all went up to the ceiling, was focused right where we are. We used to try to score as quickly as possible because I do believe I was having the beginning of what was a, a panic attack. Time you got to the center jump ball, it was over. Once I forgot to say something, so I go to Lewis, I cut my hands, and I'm screaming in his ear, and he turns around, and he's like, and I'm like, oh, you could feel it right here. I started my sophomore year, and Shaq was there, so it allowed me to start as a sophomore because of from foul line to foul line, you have transition basketball. So I was basically. A bit of a decoy, I was told to cherry pick, get the hell out of here, and get down court on the right side. Then run the baseline and wait for your screen downs. Defensively, you just gotta keep working on it. Force a middle, force them into your help. You either got Rosie or Danny in there, and Lewis can help you. 
This group of me, Hal, and Eddie were past first guards. Even though I could really shoot it, you know, if you're playing chess, the king and the queen and whatever, I've got them in place. They're going to carry you with Bowie or Shays and even a little uh, sip of Shackelford Burns. But it was time to get to uh, the new level. You know, with this four-year class and four years of Coach Bayham coaching, it was dizzying. You now had an a, a unbelievable home court in Manly, but you were talking about building a dome that you were going to play in. February 12, 1980, was not just another snowy day in central New York. That evening, it was Georgetown versus Syracuse in the final basketball game in the Manly Fieldhouse. Everyone was ready for action. And that included Marty Head. Eddie was famous for saying this. We never really got our ass kicked. We'd lose. But no one was beating our ass. My focus is always internally on my teammates and sticking together and doing what we practice all during the week. Over 18 seasons, from 1962 until this night, Syracuse was a remarkable 339 and 145. And that included their then current 57 game winning streak. Now I was able to get my points and do well but I won't lie to you, I missed some free throws late in the game to lose the game. And it was a result of Coach Thompson freezing me. The story of the game, though, to be honest, we jumped up, we were up 20. And if you read the game and the line, um, and Georgetown fought and clawed their way back through great coaching. And they actually won that game. And then John Thompson announced Manly Fieldhouse officially closed. I'm sure he was tired because they were down 20 in the first half, and we were rolling. Um, but it didn't work out that way. And I don't really know th this many years later what exactly happened. But in the first half, we were up 20, probably up 10 at half. And they whittled it down and um, broke our backs on it. But the thing is, it's not like we weren't going to uh, have our say another day. Numbers again. As we've seen before, a number is just a number, and a digit can never tell you the real story. And it really was very rewarding. Together, forever. I mean, I think history is no matter what you're doing, mm -hmm. history is, is important. And in athletics, it's important too because it, it's kind of what your legacy is. You know, they still talk about Ernie Davis and they still talk about Floyd Little. Some of our basketball kids, they still talk about them. The younger people should know there's another part of history. It's good to know, and you'll walk around, people still remember you.